everybody. Uh, I ship stuff. I uh, don't, probably don't look like an engineer, but I actually sleep on the factory floors of the world, design really. Things people think are kind of impossible, get them to work and get them to ship in high volume mass production. I've done this in, in holography, in head mounted displays, in high volume consumer electronics with things that were seemingly impossible. The way I did that is by re-engineering subcomponents, optoelectronic, electronic, display, optical subcomponents. And so that's really uh, what I want to talk to you about today, but sort of played into a different area. And I have to do a disclaimer first. This is my hobby. My full-time job's at Facebook and Oculus, but this isn't work I do there. It's work I did before I got there and outside of it. One of the big problems of our time, one of the big goals, one of the big focuses of technology and science is on how to reverse engineer the human brain. We see the White House Brain Initiative, the European Brain Study, the National Academies putting this work front and center as this is the moment to figure out how our brains work, to finally understand and hopefully cure things like mental disease, neurodegenerative disease, and to understand ourselves and understand how we think and each other and hopefully communicate better with each other. So I've been working on this for many years and over the last five years, I've been really fascinated by the advances with this technology. And it's functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. Many of you have probably laid in such a machine, but it's being used to decode what we're thinking by looking at oxygen flow. The oxygen flow can be measured in small cubes, like these kind of cubes on the stage, but very small, one millimeter voxels or cubes, by looking at the oxygen flowing in your brain, where the oxygen is is where you're thinking or where the brain is active, and where it isn't is where it's not active. And using this technology, we can, and it's been shown, uh, decode using big data collection and and analytical algorithms in the computer, see what you're imagining, hear the music in your head, see and read the words that you're thinking of. And this has been shown in study after study after study. And I've just, I was completely sucked in by this. So I read a lot of neuroscience on the side, again, my hobby, and I'm just like, whoa, how do we reduce this down to a cap so that we can communicate with human thought, because I think that could change everything, and I think it's in reach in the near future, not so distant future. And so I guess the question really is, on this system, the res this is a very big system, and you look at this and you think, how can you get higher resolution? Because right now we can see images, but they're grainy and a little bit out of focus, hear most of music, see a lot of words, but how do we get this to higher resolution, and there's really three things that need to happen. We need to increase the resolution of the system itself, which is very hard because this is already essentially a very huge magnet. We also need to increase the data set acquisition, and that's hard because there's only about tops a few hundred of these systems in the world today being used for functional magnetic resonance imaging to, to do uh, functional brain scanning. And then finally, can we improve the analyt analytics to decode what we're thinking better? With those three improvements, the implication for our ability to communicate are profound. For example, could you imagine a movie director who wakes up with an idea for a new scene in her head to be able to dump a rough cut to the computer so she could share this new idea she had with her creative team without the usual confusion? Or a musician, if he wakes up with an idea for a new song in his head, but the layering of the music is so hard to get out in the usual process, it takes weeks or months. It could really change the way creatives work and all of us work if we could be able to dump rough cuts of our ideas directly to the computer. But these systems not only are grainy and a little bit out of focus, they're also super expensive. There are a couple, few million dollars a piece, and they cost about a million dollars a year or more in upgrade and uptake costs. And so it's very hard to get more big data sets because there's so few of them. And so if we cut to last year, this system 
came online and matched the resolution of fMRI system. And this is called, the system used here is called diffuse optical tomography. It looks like a science project. It kind of is. It's a seven-figure science project. It's still expensive. But with it, we can match the resolution of fMRI, which means the computer can see what you're imagining, read the words that are in your head, and hear the music that's in your head. And so while this is kind of unwieldy, I was dazzled when I saw this, because I, I do optics. And I thought, whoa, this is my stuff. How can I help slim this down? I mean, even putting this thing on takes 20 minutes. So if we could do that, we can make brain imaging systems as consumer electronics. Um, and it could transform not just this new field that's emerging, but also low-cost medical diagnostics, where MRI is used to diagnose all kinds of conditions, but it's very expensive. In Boston, we have these, but throughout the developing world, to make it affordable, the impact could be profound there. But also, the idea of being able to export our ideas to digital media could change everything. So just to be clear, I'm talking about consumer electronics as wearable communications where we can communicate with thought alone. So this system, you see the fiber optics going to the head, but above it are detectors with four orders of magnitude resolution. And there's 80 different fibers that are shining light into the head, invisible light, infrared light, that is frequency encoded. There's a heartbeat to it. And that light can penetrate about five centimeters deep because the brain scatters that light. And it scatters more or less depending upon whether there's oxygen there because the oxygen from the, from the blood either absorbs more light or reflects more light depending upon whether the oxygen is there. So that's what the detectors do. And again, they need four orders of magnitude resolution. And to get that, they actually are sort of cooled and above the head. They can't be close to the, to the noggin, if you will. They have to be away. Single photon detectors, very expensive. Picosecond timing, that's 10 to the negative 12 seconds of resolution. And I look at this and I think, this is really cool. We got rid of the big mag magnet problem, but it's optics. But this is, this is like neuroscientists did this. And they're, they're really good at neurosciences, but they're not really good at high volume consumer electronics distinguished by optics and optoelectronics. And so the thing is, what I did was go back to the basic math to see if I could figure out a better way to do this. And I went back to the basic math and found this landmark paper in 1999 that proved diffuse optical tomography was mathematically impossible, that you couldn't solve for the diffusion versus the reflectance at the same time. And this killed the field for a decade because somebody proved it was completely impossible. So all work stopped, everybody left, except, well, as you know, not everybody, because some people love working on impossible things. And so luckily, some people kept working. And it took a decade till this guy, Bastin Harak, proved that while that was mathematically impossible, if you make a simple simplification of what's called piecewise approximation, in other words, a bit like taking a picture of you all and then looking at the pixels that show up on the camera, little segments, the way basically we solve most computation problems, what we do with most images. If we do that, it's no longer intractable. You can solve it. Diffuse op optical tomography works. Game back on for the system. And five years after this, this was in 2009, that fiber optic wig contraption I showed a couple slides ago was done and it has exceeded the resolution of magnetic resonance imaging. So just a lesson, when somebody tells you it's impossible, don't necessarily give up. So I went back to the math and took a fresh look at it with what all, that, all that I know about uh, consumer electronics and optoelectronics. And I looked at um, basically what I could do to rethink this design. A lot of people say you have to have perpendicular incidence of light. And I thought, well, that doesn't really make sense. And so, I've now come up with a design that I'm building using flexible liquid crystal displays inside of a cap illuminated with invisible light. 
And so that thing, you must think, liquid crystal displays, that's like for your TV or your laptop or your cell phone. That's just a display. Well, liquid crystals modulate light and can bend light in different ways. And the infrared light can see into your head. It can, it, it's, while it's opaque clearly to white light, you can't see in my head with this white light, the infrared light gets in, and we, we can get to five centimeters of depth to look at what we're seeing. This gives much higher resolution. Not 80 detectors and emitters, as was shown in the fiber optic wig, but every cell phone you have in your pockets today has about 8 million subpixels. Those could be emitters. Cameras on your cell phone have more than 8 million detectors. And so using this approach, we can eliminate the room size fMRI system or the fiber optic wig with scaffolding to make a much smaller system, this small. And so you're probably looking at this and you're thinking, yeah, sure. <laughs> This is crazy, right? How, how is this possible just looking at oxygen flow? If you, if, just imagine these are one millimeter cubes filled, filling your brain, looking at oxygen flow. How is it possible to collect human thought? Many people focus on studying how the neuron works. And some people believe there's six Nobel Prizes just to understand how the neuron works. And then the connections between them and the computation is intractable and on and on and on. But the facts are, study after study after study over the past five years has, showing, has shown that using the imaging of oxygen flow, big data, mass sets, and analytics, we can compute an Im what image you're imagining, what words you're thinking of, what music you're hearing in your head, and so forth. Not just 80 detectors, but 8 million can increase that resolution dramatically, and I have to say one more time, this is my hobby, it's not work I'm doing at Facebook or Oculus, but it's not impossible. And just like diffuse optical tomography was not impossible. And I believe in the very near future, wearable consumer electronics will exist where we can communicate with human thought alone. The implications are profound, and thank you very much for listening.